There we go. Good evening, good evening. Hello everyone. What's up, Julie? All right. There we go. Back at it again. Hell yeah. Oh my goodness. Forgive me if I look a little flushed. I just came back from a run a little while ago. Oof. All right. I hope everyone has had a good week so far and a good Tuesday. Oh, you're trying to put Luca to sleep. Baby Luca, go to sleep. Your mommy wants to listen to Mimi read. Hello. I'm so glad to see you guys this evening. All right, so it's eight o'clock. As is tradition, we're gonna wait till about 8.05 because um, I do wanna make a quick announcement with you guys. I know last time I said that I was gonna pick three more books um, to keep you know, doing us the, the reading schedule the way I have been, but I think I've been over ambitious with my reading schedule and um, I'm actually going to, oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually, so this book is going to finish summer reading for now. I, I'm, June is practically, is, is over. I'm going to take July off. Um, cause I'm trying, I'm trying to also dedicate a bit more time to my Nikki videos and it's not, I, I just, the way my work schedule is right now, I just don't have time to do the Nikki stuff and do the book readings and do like balance private life stuff so I just I'm gonna take July off for reading and then pick up pick back up in August so don't miss me too terribly much in July I will be back I promise um, it's over a hundred degrees in South Louisiana Ugh. yeah no no running there no so but um you know, if you're just joining us or if you've just only joined us for this reading for this book, um, I have two other books that I finished that we finished reading, you know, over the last few months. Um, you can find them on my YouTube page. So just go on to the link in my bio here on TikTok and it'll take you to my YouTube page. And I've got the books listed. They're in sequential order. So you don't have to guess which one comes next in the reading order. It's all right there for you. Um, but yeah, it's like I've been. Like even today, I was trying to get off work. I had to get to a friend's house and take care of some things and then get here and I wanted to go for a run. So I did, but then it left me with only like 15 minutes to get ready for my reading. Um, it just, it was, and I still haven't had dinner. So Tuesdays and Thursday, or Tuesdays and Fridays, it's, I, I got over ambitious for the summer. So I'm gonna pick back up in, in August, but don't panic. I, I promise I will be back in August. So I just wanted to give you guys that heads up. And, um, you know, if anyone happens to miss it, I will also, I'll also make that notification again at the end of our reading for this evening, because this will send us to the very end of the story. We've got this much. We've got this much left. And then that concludes Leonardo Swans by Karen Essex. So, uh, 8.03, yeah, we got another two minutes or so. So, oh my goodness. <sighs> oh, I must say though, we got some crazy rain here today and it was nuts, but, but it helped to cool things off here considerably. Oh, Julie, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I mean, 
being, you know, the gringa that I am, red is the only color I get, so, you know. <laughs> I gotta take my I gotta take my color where I can get it. So there's that. Oh my goodness! But no, it did make for, it did make for a really nice run. It's still a bit humid. <laughs> it's a glow. Yes, this is my my post workout glow. That's right. <laughs> but no, it's still a little bit humid here. But the temperatures have definitely dropped, and that has been a welcome blessing and a beautiful change of pace, and the rain as well. Dawn, Dawn of Tomorrow. No, I haven't read that. Who's that by? J Julie, it's, it's what outside? That's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. I, I can find, I can find it online, I'm sure. Was that a typo, Julie? Did you mean to write whatever the hell that was? Because <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> what did you mean to write? need to wait a minute it's it's dig dug outside that's the new word it's not disgusting anymore it's dig dug <laughs> all right will you You made me a pie, thank you so much. It's gonna completely undo my workout, but I will enjoy every bite. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna dive in because it's now after eight and this will conclude our reading of Leonardo Swans. So here we go. Ercole's expression did not change. Ludovico has made his own tomb, Isabella. He played all parties against each other for too many years. His ambitions and his hubris are naked for all the world to see. Louis has always laid claim to Milan. His grandmother was a Visconti, what can I say? He has as much right to the duchy as Ludovico. But Beatrice, Isabella begins, Beatrice is in her grave. We must act in the interests of the living, the smart people. And we Estes are the smartest of the smart. We'll wait this out to see who is the victor. Don't let Francesco move on behalf of anyone. Not Ludovico, not the French, not the Venetians. Here is what matters. After this is over, after Ludovico Sforza is a forgotten man long turned to dust, the house of Este will, will still be standing. And the house of Gonzaga too, God willing, if your husband follows my example. Father, I will heed your counsel, though it may cost me my heart to betray Ludovico or to sit by while he is attacked. What did she expect from her father, who, as soon as her mother's body was cold, supported the French in their invasion of her native kingdom of Naples? Isabella, why do you think I have lived to be an old man? If you want to see your dotage, you will learn from me. In these matters, the heart must hide behind the mind's greater powers of reason. I'll try to duck and cover so I don't get hit in the face with a pie. Thank you very much. She cannot. She foresees the scenario. Ludovico, with both enemies closing in on him, will write, for Nat, will write frantic letters and send hard-riding messengers to Mantua, demanding that Francesco move the army to help him. The missives will get more desperate until Ludovico realizes that he has been betrayed. He will assume that the Marchesa is, on, is in on the betrayal and he might go to his grave wondering why. Yet what good would it do her to betray her own husband, to reveal his duplicity to Ludovico? What would she do? Flee to Milan, only to be crushed herself? To end her life a fallen woman and disgraced daughter? A, a mad harridan who couldn't wait for her sister's death so that she could seize her husband? 
she hears from one of her correspondents in Venice that the Venetian army has already set march for Milan. As they cross the Ada River, the soldiers are singing, Now it's Il Moro's turn to dance. Was anything more satisfying to a human being than the downfall of the mighty? She returns home to Mantua, where she gets word that General Tru... That daggone hat. Ismail! Are you back? Are you feeling better? I hope so. She returns home to Mantua, where she gets word that General Trivulzillo, wow, Trivulzillo, excuse me, the Italian trader who left Ludovico's service years ago over his jealousy of Galeaz, is swooping down the Alps with a French army, a huge French army, upon the castle of Anona, a Milanese stronghold. Galeaz has vowed to hold the northern city of Alessandria, which would cut the French off from Milan. But his soldiers are once again unpaid and half-starved in deserting him. His brother, the Count of Cayazzo, a man of war who could more easily than Galeaz allow his heart to hide behind his greater powers of reason, has openly gone over to the French. Men other than Cayazzo, who have also dined at Ludovico's table, turn on him, riding to meet up with the French army. The predicted letters fly from Milan into Mantua, begging Francesco to move to defend Milan. Isabella herself makes a plea on behalf of her two nephews, who could lose their lives in the fray until she finds out that Ludovico has sent them off to the German court, along with a substantial sum of his gold and jewels, and is probably going to flee there himself. Ludovico makes a last appeal to his allies, but none responds. Hi, Holly. Hi, Ismail. I'm so glad to see you again. I hope you are feeling better. I'm glad you could catch up on our very last reading of the book. One by one, the people of the small cities of the Duchy of Milan, tired of paying Ludovico's heavy taxes, are encouraged by their patrons, who are tired of not being able to collect on the loans they made to the Duke, open their gates to the French. Louis, Isabella is told, is astonished at the reception he receives as he trots across northern Italy. He attributes it to his good looks, his superior lineage as a Visconti, and to Ludovico's slow drain on his people's res resources for his grand projects. Ludovico sends even more letters via messengers, whose horses have been ridden so hard that they die in Isabella's, Isabella's courtyard. Francesco gets weary of the letters and rides to Vigevano, where Beatrice and Ludovico had lavishly entertained him, and openly starts to fight at the side of Louis. He is met there by Duke Ercole, who had waited patiently in Ferrara, throwing Ludovico's desperate letters into the hearth until French victory was guaranteed. Now there is only the small matter of the Duke himself, who must surely be trying to flee Milan. She cannot imagine Ludovico putting up a hopeless fight, sword in hand, manning the castello against the French all by himself. The last she saw him, he had complained of being afflicted with gout, which made it nearly impossible for him to mount his horse. What, she wonders, will happen to her friends in Milan? Cecilia's portrait still hangs in Isabella's studiolo, seemingly asking her that very question. Will the French be kind to those who had been loyal to the Duke, or will they do what conquerors always do? Seize property, rape women, destroy the symbols of power, execute the loyalists, torture the artists, and pick the treasury dry? There is nothing that Isabella can do for Ludovico without endangering her family and the city of Mantua, but she can help his friends. She does not consult Francesco, but sends messengers to Milan to spread the word that Isabella d'Este is offering sanctuary to those who were loyal to the Duke and the late Duchess of Milan. In the letters, she urges them to flee the city before the French arrive, wearing the plumage of the conquerors. Flying on hooves that barely touch the dirt, the Mantuan riders are sent off with their missives. Isabella makes certain that the messengers know to stop at the Corte Vecchio, the residence of not only poor, disgraced Isabel of Aragon, but of Leonardo the Florentine, to let both parties know that they and their households are welcome and will be treated kindly in Mantua. Despite the fact, or perhaps because, the Marquis seems to now be so very close to the King of France. She prays that they reach Milan in time for Ludovico to hear that she has tried to help his friends. She knows that he must think that she, too, has deserted him. She has written to his brother, Asciano, in Rome, declaring that she would like to come to Milan and fight the French herself. Asciano wrote back, sarcastically suggesting that in Milan they would prefer to see her husband with his army. Ludovico can only have a low opinion of her now. 
Francesco hears that she is offering shelter to the Milanese, and he sends her a furious letter. I am fighting at the side of Louis, King of France, and you are giving sanctuary to those he means to capture. Have you lost your mind, woman? Isabella sends a brief letter in return. Your Excellency, you deal with the King of France in your way, and I will deal with him in mine. Since you are so very close to him at this moment, you may tell him so yourself. If he does not fear a weak woman, he may come to Mantua and see me on the matter. I do not fear Louis, only the French language, but I can speak it if I must. Is this King Louis not just a man like any other? And does her reputation as la prima donna del mondo, given to her by poets and courtiers from one end of Europe to the other, not already intrigue him? She knows how to deal with Louis. She assembles her staff and starts to put together a gift. No, not a gift, but a presentation, to greet the king when he inevitably reaches Milan. The order is simple. Pack up the same things we sent to Ludovico in the spring, the fresh garda and carp, the artichokes and flowers, and add, it to, and add to it a pair of our special falcons and a pair of the Marquis's hunting dogs. Have the gifts in their entirety, waiting in Ludovico's palace for the arrival of the King of France. Add this note. We wish to convey our invitation to His Excellency to come here and visit us. We know that word has reached your ears of us being pro Sforza. If Your Excellency visits us, he will convince himself that we are true French. We confess, frankly being free of falsehood, that at one time we were very fond of Duke Ludovico, as fond as one can imagine, both for reasons of kinship and because of the affection and honors he showered upon us. But after he began to treat our illustrious consort badly, our affections began to diminish and we found ourselves in accord with the aims of His Majesty, the most Christian King Louis. Now that he has shown such honors of now that he has shown such honors upon our consort, we are indeed a good Frenchwoman. Should your Excellency choose to accept our invitation to visit, he will find us clothed in fleur de lis. Your humble servant, Isabella d'Este Gonzaga, Marchesa of Mantua. Full of lies, but no matter. It would bring about the desired end, safety for Mantua and for Isabella's Milanese friends. Still, every cloud has a silver lining, and in her dark moment, Isabella wonders if Leonardo the Florentine will take her up on her offer of shelter. Does she dare rekindle that desire? But why not? As her father said, we must act in the interest of the living, and she is still very much alive. Yet she finds that looking at Cecilia's portrait has become unbearable. The portrait freezes that moment in time when Cecilia was young and lovely, her only care the pleasure of the Duke. None of the young woman's later sorrows can be predicted in her serene face. Surely she shocked she suffered when Beatrice came to court and removed her from the home and affections of the man she had known and loved for ten years. Is she, at this moment, packing whatever her horses can carry and fleeing another cherished home? When they are all gone, the lot of them erased from memory, the portrait will still stand as a tribute to beauty, intelligence, and serenity. No one will think of the pain that the sitter endured, only of her beauty and her good fortune in being immortalized by the great genius of her day. All of the pain and sorrow will die with her. In the end, it will be, it will have been the sorrow that was temp, it will, mm, goodness, in the end, it will have been the sorrow that was the temporary thing. For you, immortality is at the end of a paintbrush. For me, it is at the end of my husband's cock. I will achieve immortality through the births of my sons. Isabella recalls how shocked she was when Beatrice said those words. It appears now that Beatrice may have been incorrect. Her sons have been whisked off to the court of Emperor Max in frosty Germany, probably pining for their dead mother and the Italian son. Would they ever be allowed to return to Milan? Which would carry Beatrice on into history? Her issue or her images? Would the French smash to pieces the beautiful bust by Cristoforo, along with the marble twin tomb Ludovico had commissioned for himself and his wife? Would the walls of the refectory painted by the great magistro be whitewashed by the next generation of clergy, wiped away as useless and antiquated by a new generation? Or, more likely, would the French not want reminders of the reign of Ludovico and tear the refectory down, perhaps torturing the friars? 
Oh, all of them would end up nothing but specks of Italian dirt, churned together for the rest of their dead countrymen. Should La Fortuna be generous and allow them to die on Italian soil, just more creatures who walked the earth and left it. What did it matter, anyway? Fortune is having her way with them all, with Isabella, who once believed that Beatrice had been dealt the better hand, and with Beatrice, who could always make the best of any hand dealt to her, amazing knights and ladies with her luck. Now the luck has run out. The city of Milan, which was in its early days of greatness when Leonardo picked up the brush and painted the Duke's seventeen-year-old mistress, is about to witness its own end. Everyone who had made it what it was, the Athens of modern Europe, is now running for his life. The great treasures, paid for by the people who finally decided that they no longer wanted to finance the Duke's dreams of beauty, would be scattered to the four winds. Like Pericles, whose people got tired of his vast ambitions and found him guilty of theft, Ludovico would pay for his visions of a grand city. Suddenly Isabella feels very tired, not fatigued in the body, but so heavy in the heart that she wants to sink to the ground. She is weary, not just of the present, but of the whole of history, how it continues to laboriously repeat itself, how the cast of characters changes, but scenarios remain the same as if God were some untalented dramatist who could only write one play. She picks up a long black muslin tarp which she had used to block the sunlight from the windows of her studio low after Beatrice died, for that is what Beatrice's death brought, the end of warmth and light and all that was good. She drapes the cloth over Cecilia's face, letting it fall to the ground, shrouding the memories of the innocent past. To Isabella d'Est Gonzaga, Marchesa of Mantua, from Georges d'Ambois, from Georges d'Ambois, ambassador to the King of France. Madam, I humbly beg you to forgive the bad opinion we have held of you. Now that you are a good French woman, we are your humble servants. Soon, the much matured face of Cecilia Gallerani, swollen with weight and worry, is standing in Isabella's parlor. She has fled Milan, along with all of Lud Ludovico's other close allies, sneaking away as Louis entered the city. She throws her arms around Isabella, who takes in the stale smell of travel hanging on Cecilia's clothes. Forgive me, I am full of gnats and dust, she says, but thank God for you, your excellency. My husband and I were making desperate plans when your messenger arrived. I have brought my two sons with me. The Count has gone into hiding. We thought these arrangements best. On the road, soldiers would be less likely to harm the boys if they were, are traveling with their mother. Isabella sends Cecilia into her quarters to wash her face and catch her breath. She has known that refugees from Milan would begin to arrive, and she has ordered several small palazzos just outside of town be readied for their guests. This news, plus the opportunity to cleanse the grime of travel from her face and neck, cheers Cecilia, and she settles into Isabella's parlor with a bowl of hot broth and a cup of wine. What has happened to our brother-in-law? Isabella asks, afraid of the answer. Louis has always hated Ludovico. She cannot, she cannot imagine that his treatment of the Duke would be kind. He is on the run. As soon as Ludovico heard that the people of his precious Pavia opened their gates to the French, he realized that the citizens of Milan could not be expected to behave any differently. Ludovico treated Pavia as one of his personal treasures. After all of his fantastic improvements to that city, why did the people turn on him? Trouble has been brewing. The scholars at the University of Pavia haven't been paid in a year and have been defecting in droves. Taxes kept rising, but nothing improved for the people except Ludovico's buildings and monuments, which doesn't exactly put food in the mouths of the poor. Isabella feels a wash of shame pass through her body. Her husband, her father, and two of her brothers rode to Pavia to greet Louis. As former friends of Ludovico, they showed the king around the new, his new palace and hunting grounds. A young favorite of Isabella's in their entourage wrote to her to say that the strangest thing in the whole arrangement was that Ludovico's name was never mentioned. Everyone pretends that the duke has never existed. Ludovico finally received word from Emperor Max that he was able to spare reinforcements and to fortify the castello until they could arrive. Miss Deborah, hello, happy Tuesday. But the Duke knew that he could not afford to wait. 
In the event that Louis reached Milan before the German army, I tried to see him before he left, but I was minutes too late. Oh, everything was in confusion and chaos. He left his treasurer in charge of the castello and had packed up what he could. I am told that he insisted that his last stop be Beatrice's tomb, where he knelt for hours, crying and begging her forgiveness. You know that he still carries the guilt from the Duchess's death. Finally, his men dragged him away, and just in time, because Louis was riding in from the south. Isabella thinks, but does not say, that Ludovico would have enjoyed the demonstration of histrionics at Beatrice's tomb, but he would be careful not to allow it to interfere with his escape. You can't imagine what happened next, Cecilia said. Milan has produced its own Judas. The treasurer, to whom Ludovico had entrusted the guardianship of the castello, sent a secret message to Louis, saying that he would fling open the castello gates if Louis would cut him a share of the loot. Even the French think the man is disgusting. Imagine Louis' surprise when that grand fortress was surrendered to him without a blow. It seems that there is no end to the number of trusted friends who will betray Ludovico, Isabella says suddenly. I am almost grateful to God, in his wisdom, that, in, that he in his wisdom took my sister before she had to bear all of this. I hardly understand it. We are aware of Ludovico's defects, but has he deserved this? Cecilia leaves the question unanswered. They say that when Louis entered the Castello, he thought he was entering a fairy tale. I thought the same all those years ago, Isabella says, pushing aside her own memories of riding across the Grand Moat and into Ludovico's world for the first time. She does not want to cry. Not yet. The French, those brutish creatures, had never seen rooms of such extravagant size, decorated with our particular Italian grandeur, and the gardens astonished them. The French king has declared it a paradise on earth. What will become of Ludovico's possessions? She thinks of all the ancient manuscripts shelved in Pavia, wondering if they have been scattered by the French, who would have no understanding of their real value. Here's the story I heard. The teller of the tale swears it is true. The French are desecrating the Castello. They've no idea how to behave. Apparently, def defecating in one's own hallway is a way of life for the soldiers and fornicating where they can be where they can be seen by others indeed in the company of other fornicating couples does not bother them in the least but is part of the french national character the halls of the of the castello are dung heaps your excellency its rooms the whore houses of corporals and sergeants what will become of ludovico's great paintings his statues from antiquity his priceless tapestries some of it will be preserved i am sure the French king does ardently admire our artists. Louis visited the refectory at the Santa Maria della Grazia and asked his men to investigate moving the entire wall upon which the magistrate's last supper is painted to France. I'm grateful that my portrait by him is safe with you, for the king would certainly confiscate it if it had remained in Milan. He's probably going through my rooms, taking whatever he wants as we speak. If Louis and his entourage, her father and brothers included, visited the refectory, surely they must have crossed the courtyard to see Beatrice's tomb. How could they have looked at her marble death mask without weeping in front of the French king? How could they have faced the poor Duchess, even in death? Isabella hopes that the experience made all of them sick. Louis is looking everywhere for the magistro because he recognizes his genius, as if Ludovico had not done that eighteen years ago. And did he remain in Milan? Isabella asks, hoping to find that Leonardo was one of the refugees headed for her kingdom. No, Leonardo packed up his household and fled for the hills of Bergamo, where he intends to conduct some nature experiment, or so he says. He did receive your kind offer of shelter and will undoubtedly come here after he wearies of life in a small hill hilltop town. At least he is safe. Perhaps she will send a messenger to Bergamo to look for Leonardo, repeating her offer. She has already selected a lovely manor home for him on the Po River, with gardens and a view of the water. Old Mantenega will be jealous out of his mind, but what can he do? I have a message for you from Isabel of Aragon. She is determined to make peace with Louis. She is going to beg for something for her sons. But if she cannot reach an understanding with him, she is going to come here. 
please give her a house that is not within a reasonable distance from where you quarter me. Of course, I feel all compassion for her, but everyone is sick to death of hearing her troubles. She's a beautiful woman, or was. Why doesn't she go get another husband, one that will actually take her to bed? Some women have no sense of how to survive in this world, Isabella offers. To others, it's an instinct, like an animal's knowledge of how to feed itself. Though it may initially disgust us, we will charm King Louis and clothe ourselves in lilies, until that, too, is no longer in fashion. I had hoped that my sister was one of our kind, but I'm afraid that she gave in to her fragile, womanly heart at the end. How marvelous she was in her early days! She vacated Ludovico's bed and his heart of me by the force of her will. I admired her all the while, I truly did, and even more so when she meant when she magnanimously reached out to me in friendship. The poor darling would be in exile now, in Germany, with her sons. I doubt that even my father's new alliance with King Louis could have saved her that. A woman rises and is damned with her husband, Isabella sighs, though she has made a private vow to transcend that fate. Your Excellency, I have done a bad thing. Cecilia looks around the room as if to see as, as if anyone is listening. I have stolen something for you. From the Castello? Yes. Then you haven't stolen the object, but protected it. That is precisely what I thought. I saw this when I tried to see Ludovico one last time. I simply could not leave it behind for greedy French hands to desecrate. Cecilia calls for her valet, who, with another man, carries in a bundle, wrapped in layers of cloth. Slowly they unwrap it, carefully handling its heavy contents. Turning it end over end, they reach the final layer of cloth, sitting the bundle on top of a refectory table and letting the muslin fall. Isabella puts her hand over her mouth. It is Cristoforo's bust of Beatrice, commissioned by Ludovico before he married her. Her sister's girlish face stares back at her, serene and gentle tiny curls caressing her chubby, angelic cheeks and the intricate lace that lined her bosom. Isabella can see Beatrice in her dress, excited to pose for the sculptor. She remembers the pains taken that day with Beatrice's difficult mane of hair, how it was twisted almost torturously into the tight braid that became Beatrice's signature hairstyle. The image, the image is almost too much for the surviving sister to bear. She embraces Cecilia, hoping that the tears forming in her eyes will be easily controlled. It is guaranteed to be a long week, what with people arriving from Milan. She cannot exhaust herself so early in the day. You have brought me my sister, Isabella says, her voice catching on a tiny sob. Isabella's tears are interrupted by the entry of her footman. Your Excellency, may I, ent may I announce another visitor? As you wish, the Marchesa says, releasing Cecilia. Madonna Lucrezia Crivelli and son, recently, of Milan. Isabella cannot help it. She curses herself for her ways, but there it is. There is nothing she can do about the fact that her first thought is that Lucrezia might have brought with her the painting by the Magistro. Oh, she realizes that she should want to murder the woman for the pain she caused to Beatrice, but that is not the idea that crept into her mind. Forgive me, dear Lord Jesus, for my sins, but I cannot help the order in which ideas occur to me. It is my nature, wicked though it is. I do not recall sending. I do not recall sending an invitation to Madonna Lucrezia. Isabella says to Cecilia. The message which we received was that the Marchesa would harbor in Mantua all those who had been loyal to the Duke. I was thinking of sheltering those who had been loyal to my sister not those in her service who betrayed her. Could she really turn Lucrezia away? Isabella thinks that she might. It would serve the woman right for sneaking around with Ludovico behind Beatrice's back. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive us our lack of compassion. Your Excellency, if I might say a few words on behalf of Madonna Lucrezia, I will always hear what you have to say, dear friend. The Crivellis are a fine enough family, but hardly of noble birth. I am speaking from experience, Your Excellency. When the Duke of Milan chooses you for his companion, 
there is little choice in it for the lady. She might express that she is unwilling, but rejecting one of the great princes of Italy is rather challenging for a woman. I imagine that Madonna Lucrezia saw much opportunity in the liaison for her entire family, even for her husband, if she paired with the duke. It is one of the few ways for a woman to elevate the status of her clan. In other words, Your Excellency, I do not believe the liaison was as much a selfish act on the part of Lucrezia as it may appear. Cecilia is correct, of course. While a princess of Ferrara might be able to control how far she is willing to let her flirtation with the duke proceed, a girl of ordinary birth may not. If she denied her prince, she might cause terrible problems for her family, whereas giving the duke what he wanted would curry favor for all of her loved ones. Thank you for reminding me, uh, for reminding us that we should not punish another woman for acting in the interest of herself and her family. Is that not what we always do, regardless of the circumstances of our birth? She tells her footman to let Madonna Lucrezia into the room. The little boy looks more like Ludovico than his sons with Beatrice. His mother has had his thin, black baby hair cut in the exact style of Il Moro, long, straight bangs that hang to the brows, and the rest curving around his face and skimming his shoulders. "'How can such a little one possess such hair?' Isabella exclaims, taking the child from his mother, whose eyes are open wide in either astonishment or gratitude or both. She must have expected a less enthusiastic greeting from her lover's wife's sister. "'He is six months old, Your Excellency, and was born with this mane of black hair.' Isabella's welcome must have given her confidence because she adds, The Duke once accused me of mating with a horse. A blush spreads across Lucrezia's face as rapidly as a bad rash. Conscious of her tenuous position at the mercy of her lover's sister-in-law, she smiles awkwardly and turns away from Isabella's disapproving gaze. Lucrezia's smile drops when she recognizes Beatrice's bust, sitting almost as if in judgment upon the table. A silence falls over the women, and Isabella lets it linger. She hands the baby back to its mother. Did you believe that you were in danger in Milan, Madonna Lucrezia? King Louis's hatred of Il Moro is well known. I feared for my boy. Yet the Duke did not encourage me to flee with him. When I heard that Your Excellency was offering sanctuary, I came immediately. I realize it is awkward. If you wish me to go, I will try to make my way to see relatives at Cremona. The Duke made no provisions for your safety, Isabella asks, almost incredulous. It would not be like Ludovico to discard mother and child without a thought for the safety or well-being of either. No, he very generously settled upon me estates at Cusago and Sorono, but I am afraid that those are in the hands of the French now. I have no idea if they will be permanently confiscated." What about your husband? He is less than enthusiastic about my welfare since the birth of the Duke's son. An old tale, retold thousands of times in every generation, Isabella thinks. The girl could not have guessed that when she jeopardized her husband's feelings to become intimate with the great Prince of Milan, the inheritor of the houses of Visconti and Sforza, that she was choosing the wrong man. Now, like so many women who took what seemed to be a risk-free gamble, she has left she has been left with no man, only the man's issue. La Fortuna seems to be getting the last laugh on them all. Not to worry. I have a small house where you will be comfortable. You may have it all to yourself, depending on how many appear from Milan in the coming weeks. Lucrezia bows. You are the essence of kindness. I expect to soon begin negotiations with King Louis for, well, for many things. I will recommend both of you to him, and I will negotiate with his counselors for the return of your estates and your personal property. Now both of the mistresses of Ludovico bow to the sister of his wife. What a strange world I find myself living in, Isabella thinks. What would Beatrice make of it all? But she remembers Beatrice's, com Beatrice's passionate campaign for Ludovico's investiture of the title of Duke, her sudden shift in loyalty from her beloved Neapolitan grandfather to her husband. Beatrice would have understood everything, even taking in Ludovico's mistress and bastard son. Did Beatrice not do as much herself for Cecilia at one time? But our exquisite city! 
Lucrezia looks at Isabella as if pleading with her to change events that are well underway. The past is gone, my dear, Isabella says, realizing that she sounds more pitiless than the heaviness in her heart would, indi would indicate. All we have is the present, and how we conduct ourselves will determine our futures. My father and brothers and my husband are at this moment in the company of the French king. They have already taken him... They have taken him already on a hunting expedition, believe it or not, on Ludovico's lands, where they have made sport in the recent past in the company of the Duke. I received the letter this very morning. So you see that if the houses of Gonzaga and Este, two of the most ancient in Italy, have suddenly become French, then you all have the ability to become French. Yes? Oui? Que pensez-vous du miracle? Lucrezia lightly touches the ivory of the clavichord. Is this the instrument from the castello or a copy? It is the very one. It took me more than half a year of after my sister's death to procure it, but I wanted to have a memento of her. We both love music so much. I recall that the Duchess could not play it, and was forever inviting musicians to court to play it for her. She took great delight in its sound. Did she? Your Excellency, forgive me, Lucrezia says, blushing again. Of course you know these things. My sister loved music and song, though she did not successfully produce either, and was constantly demanding to be sung to and played for. I obliged her throughout our childhoods. Shall we oblige her now? Isabella begins to play a melody that all of them would know, one that Beatrice would often request. The two sisters sang it together, usually at the end of an evening, for its lyrics and melody proved rather serious for most parties. Isabella plays one verse and then signals for the others to join in. How sweetly the three of them sing together. Isabella wonders if the other two have worked as hard as she has to improve their voices. Beatrice never wanted to practice her singing. She liked to chirp along as Isabella played and carried the song. She loved the fun of it. Was there something in mastering the art of singing that is responsible for the three survivors harmonizing like birds who have long shared the same nest, while Beatrice lies in her grave. It seems impossible, yet that idea slides seamlessly into the next, the one that Isabella has turned over and over in her mind for years, but which now calls for fresh examination. What might a marriage between Ludovico and herself, cool-headed and judicious, have produced? Beatrice would en could enchant Ludovico. She could fuel his ambitions and do his bidding, but she could not control him. Give her credit, Beatrice had been able to represent her husband in matters of diplomacy in a way that her candor and warm nature could cover for his duplicity. But Isabella could have steered him along the path to ever-increasing greatness. Ludovico needed more than a girl with spirit, more than a woman who would do anything to please him. He needed a cool head and a firm hand to help him through the difficult times. Cecilia's voice rises to take the high note on the last verse, while, Lucre while Lucrezia takes the low, coming just under Le Cecilia's lovely trill and repeating the words in a mournful register. Now all three women have tears in their eyes. Isabella wonders what is motivating the tears of the others, the loss of Ludovico and his patronage, the uncertainty of exile, Sadness at the death of the young duchess, wronged by at least one of them. Or relief that through the seeming misfortune of their lesser births, they have escaped Beatrice's fate. Isabella's tears are for her sister's fate, but also they, they are new tears over an old question. Would the entire world have been different if Ludovico had not been so damn pleased with Cecilia and had, been, and had sent off for a wife just a little sooner? It was a bad choice. That, be, that bespoke of laziness, lust, arrogance, and a lack of respect for political realities, as if all the world would wait upon his personal desires. Hey, hey, D.W. There are no small enemies and no small choices. How often had her father drilled that idea into her young head? One must be eternally vigilant in one's thinking. From what seems a small, light thing, there proceeds a great ruin. Where has she heard that before? Not from her father, she is sure, but she is sure of its wisdom.
Isabella realizes that in her contemplation she has dropped out of the singing and rejoins the sweet duet. The three survivors of Ludovico's affection sing their final verse to the one who could not weather his love. Beatrice's young and blameless face looks back at them, passing no judgment. But Isabella doubts that Ludovico will take that stance. He will blame the French, King Louis, Francesco, the Venetians, her father, even herself. He will blame God, Fortuna, whomever it crosses his mind to abjure. But he did not seal his own fate with his self-indulgence. But did he not seal his own fate with his self-indulgence and his foolishness, which had begun long, long ago? And did her sister not design her own demise when she abandoned her senses and decided to love him? Perhaps La Fortuna is not so fickle after all. From the book, notebook of Leonardo. Write letter to French commander about protecting property rights to vineyard. Have the boxes of books ready in the morning for muleteer. Use some bedding to pack and protect. Don't forget to pick up small stove from refectory. Take sheaths of paper and box of colors belonging to Jean Perial, and do not forget to ask him for his method of, for drying color and get the recipe for making white salt and colored paper. Take boxes of seeds, including lily and watermelon. Send savings to the bank at Monte de Pieta in Florence for safekeeping. Note to Bramante. We'll try to meet him in Rome. Send salai with, with word to Luca Pacioli to be packed and ready in the morning. The saletta is unfinished. Bramante's building projects unfinished. The castello is a prisoner. The duke's revenues are seized. The duke has lost his state, his possessions, and his liberty. And none of his projects have been completed. By the time the magistro arrived in Mantua, Isabella had taken in so many refugees from Milan that she had to scramble to find quarters for him. But she would have thrown her own mother, God rest her soul, and Lord Jesus forgive me, but you know it's true, out of her chambers to accommodate so great an artist. She had arranged temporary quarters for him and his travel party, promising him a lovely home either in town or in the countryside if he would remain in her service, but the magistro had already found a new employer. I am on my way to Venice by request of the Signory. One of Duke Ludovico's last strategies was to incite the Turks to attack the Venetian frontiers to distract the army. The Turks would do anything to prevent the French from crossing their country again on another crusade, so they have begun to plague the Venetians with great enthusiasm. I will demonstrate to our friends in Venice how to wipe out the entire barbarian army by flooding the valley they occupy. In addition, the Signori has asked to see designs for my inventions of, to fight the, the enemy in vessels that sail below the sea's surface. How ingenious, Isabella said. Would you be so kind as to show me the designs? I am most curious. But the magistro affected a grave look. Lowering his voice, he answered her. I cannot, Your Excellency though nothing would please me more than to indulge your curiosity. I must not divulge these, des these designs because the, of the evil nature of men, in whose hands it might cause much murder and mayhem on the seabed. As we speak, I have lawyers drawing up contracts in secret. A motto to live by is this. Do not teach anyone, and you alone will excel. Strange and mysterious man. So he was on his way, with no intention to remain in her service. I see that you have made your own plans, but before you leave us, may I remind you of the long and illustrious career Andrea Mantega has enjoyed under our patronage. We are very stable here in Mantua, and not to mention the constancy of rule of my own family at Ferrara. My husband and my father are at this moment entertaining the King of France. You would be protected here, allowed to concentrate on work, and I assure you, without cares of money. Only the demands of the Venetian government would allow me to dare disappoint you, Your Excellency. My strongest desire would be to serve you. However, I have committed to the Signory. There is nothing we can do. He said it without sounding as if he was patronizing her, but Isabella was certain that that was precisely what he was doing. Do say you will consider the idea. Perhaps when you have finished your service to the Venetians, you will return to us. I am honored by the suggestion. It will be utmost in my mind at all times. 
he bowed formally, signaling that it was time for him to leave her presence, or rather, signaling that the conversation concerning his employment in Mantua was over. As she looked up at the top of his graying head of hair and through to his scalp, she thought that what he had said was incontestably proper, but unlikely in the extreme to contain any element of truth. What a perfectly cagey man! Nevertheless, she would not allow him to get away without sitting for him. She did sense, however, as, as she had with Leonardo so many years ago, that one must be patient with him. Charming, but no lover of women, he would neither be manipulated nor would he, be, nor would he give in to demands. So she waited, housing his small entourage and indulging his requests. His demands were two. He wished to visit the singer Al Atalante Migliorotti, with whom he originally traveled to Milan before entering Ludovico's service, and he wished to study the frescoes of Andrea Mantenega in the wedding chamber of the Mantuan Castello. Mantenega had painted the walls and ceiling of the chamber in a way that appeared to open the room into the outdoors. The domed ceiling was transformed into a painted sky, from which ladies and beauty appeared to be looking down into the room from above. The magistro spent hours in the chamber, studying for a very long time, according to the, the report Isabella received. We the hind of a dog, replete with long and shaggy testicles. It reminded Isabella of Ludovico's remarking on the fact that Leonardo had spent more time looking at horses' asses than any man in history. Perhaps the magistro had an ambitious project planned around canines, or perhaps he was indulging his fascination with anatomy, be it human or bestial. Isabella waited and waited for Leonardo to suggest a sitting, and finally, on the eve of his departure, he sent a note asking if he might sketch her in her parlor before he left for his military occup occupations. When she arrives, he has taken over the room entirely. Her finely carved table is now his workbench, his materials scattered upon cloths next to the bust of her sister. She has not moved it since its arrival, but it causes no reaction in the magistro that she can discern. Music fills the room. He has employed a, du a duet of flute and lyre players who pluck and blow an airy melody. She feels like a dancer as she takes her seat in the chair that he has repositioned away from the hearth and into a ray of light seeping in from one of the lot of windows, one of the low windows. Without consciously orchestrating her motions, she feels as if her ver every movement is in time to the music, arranged by some unseen choreographer. She sinks into the chair gracefully, letting her arms fall gently at her sides. She has worn her best jewelry, which turns out to be a mistake. He asks her with the utmost deference, of course, but at the same time makes it known that there is to be no discussion on the matter to remove the gold necklace of one hundred links and the large rings adorning her fingers. Her ladies take the jewelry from her, moving like dancers to the rhythms of the stringed instrument. Utter simplicity, your excellency, he says. When I paint a woman, I wish to reveal the essence of the woman, not the extravagance of her jewels. The adornments detract. She wants to issue a hundred commands to him to make sure that he gets the portrait of which she has been dreaming for so long. Yet he invites no comments, and she is enjoying the dreamlike quality that the music is creating. Has this not been for so long a dream? Why should the reality not feel as such? Isabella recognizes the boy apprentice whose indifference toward his master she had seen displayed in Leonardo's studio ten years ago. He is still beautiful, this young man whom Leonardo calls Salai, and still serves the magistro with an attitude alternating between flamboyance and disdain. Disdain to be serving anyone at all, or disdain to be serving the artist, Isabella cannot tell. But Salai, now tall and probably past his twentieth birthday, produces the supplies Leonardo requests. Chalk of red and black, pastels of many colors for shading, sheets of paper of different grades and thickness and size, with a flourish that should be, deserved, that should be reserved for the presentation of great creations of one's own. Salai offers the magistro's tools with the pomp with which a great chef enters a dining room with his specially prepared delicacies and pre presents them to a king. I have not picked, picked the next book yet, Ishmael, but I will actually be making an announcement when I'm done with uh, the reading this evening, having to do with the next reading. So sit tight. I'll get to that when we're done reading.
The apprentice, too, seems as if he is dancing. The young man's curls are still abundant, unlike the magistro's, which have begun to thin. Though the artist is still fit, he has affected a slightly hunched posture that Isabella has not seen in the past. His dress has not diminished in style or extravagance. Both men did seem to bother to pack all their finery before fleeing the French. She cannot help but notice. The apprentice is dressed in grades of silvery fabric, with fancy oversized sleeves that keep getting in the way of performing his duties. His every movement threatens to disturb something that he has just carefully placed. The magistro pays him no mind as he distractedly receives the materials. Staring at Isabella, excuse me, as if she were not all real, but not at all real, but some object in nature he is contemplating. I have in mind to do a sketch in which the head is in profile with the body in a counterpose turned forward, he says, as if the body and the face might say two entirely different things. The language of the face expresses itself through the eyes and the smile, but the language of the body has so many more tools. Yes, I am going to keep reading, but I am going to take something of a hiatus. I'll, I'll, I'll get into it. Don't worry. Isabella wants to talk to him, to discuss the theories behind his art, to hear the contents of, his, of the mind that has created such extravagant beauty, but she does not speak to him. It would be like interrupting an expert marksman as he aims his shot, or a poet as he searches for the exact metaphor. He gently moves her arms, placing them as he would like them to be. One must always make the figure so that the breast is not turned in the same direction as the head. Let the movements of the head and arms be natural and pleasing, with various twists and turns. The hands folded just so. Yes, I like that. You will see. You will be very pleased with the drawing. The threat of this, of this endeavor being arrested in this, its nascent stage, startles Isabella out of her dreamy state. This is just a preliminary sketch, is it not? You will produce the oil before not too long? Oh, how horrible it would be to remain a mere chalk drawing, never bursting into the full bloom of an oil, never to receive the colors, the qualities of dark and light, the shadows, the gradations, the subtleties and translucent beauty that only an oil could offer. She mustn't allow it to happen. But the tales of Leonardo's procrastination and the creative ways that he frustrated Ludovico for years falls upon the Isabella's memory with a giant thump, which reverberates through her entire system. How will she see to it that he, that he completes the oil and not leave her as a mere sketch? She, Isabella d'Este, muse to so many, must not be just another study, a mess of scribbles and lines on a thin sheet of paper. Oh yes, the painting. Do not worry, it will capture your excellency in all her stunning complexity. But these works do take some time, and I ask that your excellency be patient. Are you certain about the pose, Magistro? A profile, a profile so conventional, so very yesteryear in style. The great beauty of his portraits is that he does not paint in profile. It is hard to capture a soul when it is not looking in one's direction. But in your case, Your Excellency, I do not think of this as a profile. I think of it as looking ahead into the future. He smiles at her in a way that she thinks is not a smile that an artist reserves for his patron, or for one of illustrious birth, but one that, for just an instant, allows her to know that he has, indeed, seen into her soul. He's read it, she thinks, and accurately so. She is one who will always keep her sights set forward. Perhaps that is an attribute we share, Maestro. Perhaps that is why the two of us share the two of us are here, while others less fortunate, less forward thinking, have been left to the past. An honor, Your Excellency, to share so many attributes with you at all. She can tell that he is pondering whether or not she has given him, or either of them, a compliment. Lowering his eyes, he picks up the black chalk and hesitates not one second before letting it hit the paper in slow swirls of motion. His face, however, is still and blank, revealing not one clue as to how he feels about either his subject or the likeness of her which, which he is in the process of creating. 
She wants to talk more about a schedule for the painting, but she dare not. The sitting has begun. She is frustrated, trying to remain still and dreamy for Leonardo, for she wishes to be portrayed with an expression of utmost intelligence and serenity. The two are not always complementary qualities present at the same time in the same face, but if anyone can capture the complexity, as he said, it would be the magistral. But she mustn't spoil it by allowing the more commandeering aspects of herself to be exposed. She must be remembered as a woman of the future, a woman of vision, not the bossy creature he must sometimes think she is. If only she could sit for him and watch his progress at the same time. With other artists, she has not paid. She has not had this desire. She has always known that if she was not pleased with the results, she could either cajole or threaten them into making changes until she was satisfied. But the magistra was different. She is all too aware that he will make his sketch and be on his way before she can have a proper word with him. The man is inflexible, even for an artist. One second. I'm sorry. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> so she sits quietly, feeling the softness of her hands as they lie upon one, up, lie one upon the other, hoping that she is the embodiment of serenity itself. When his pronouncement that he has finished startles her out of her reverie, before she can speak, he is packing it away. But may I not see it? Oh no, not before I shade it properly. I will spend the next several days doing so, and then I shall be off. But what will you work? F but what will you work from for the oil? She asks, hoping that her alarm, her distrust of him to finish the project, cannot be read on her face. I intend to make a copy of it to take with me. You shall have my original. And with that pronouncement, he and his assistant and his musicians are gone. Three days later, he has the sketch sent to her. She asks of his whereabouts, only to learn that he has left Mantua at sunrise. Of course. His letter thanks her profusely for her hospitality, promising her delivery of the portrait of herself in oil at an undisclosed date in the future, depending upon the extent to which the Venetians require his services in matters of weaponry and military engineering. But he is gone, escaping her comments on the sketch, absolving himself of any chance of hearing requests for changes, or worse yet, another sketch entirely. Isabella had stayed awake most of the night preparing herself for the latter, wondering how she would phrase such a request. Should she look upon Leonardo's sketch and not be pleased? One would have to be most discreet, direct, but not demanding, solicitous and complimentary, yet firm in expressing one's desires. And if all else failed, there was always the promise of money, which generally accomplished miraculous results with artists. A little up front, with much more upon delivery, if one ever hopes to receive the promised piece. She snatches the sketch sheathed between two thick pieces of parchment from the messenger and spirits it away to her private rooms, feeling her heart pump louder and faster as she puts the paper down on her desk, revealing it. She is looking into the future. Her face is in profile, but the rest of her body is forward. She's not entirely successful in suppressing her more commanding aspects because she looks, to herself at least, as if she might be gazing upon some project she commissioned, judging whether or not it meets her approval. Perhaps this is what the magistro meant to convey, that it is this very project upon which she is looking. She does not appear to be composed within herself, and intelligent, yes, she appears serene and commanding all at once. The lines of her face, her hair, and her body are soft, though not serious and pinched. Even the hard stripes of her garment have been softened to flatter the curve of her bosom. She is sure that the cut of her dress was actually lower than it is, than it is drawn. She appears more serene than sexual, that is certain. But there is nothing unflattering about the piece, though she hopes that the tiny pocket of fat under her chin does not make it into the oil. 
What strikes her most are her hands, folded so simply with the index and middle fingers slightly separated, relaxed and natural, yet looking as if she might be holding something inside herself with those hands, which she does not wish to be revealed. How she would like to speak to him about it, not to demand the revisions he undoubtedly fled at daybreak to escape, but to compliment him on the piece, to say that this sketch alone has fulfilled her dreams. No, she would not say that because if she did, he would never deliver, it, deliver the promised oil, and that she must have. She did not dream that the magistrate would not deliver the sketch himself, instead entrusting it to a messenger of the court. In retrospect, however, she should have anticipated the sly move on his part, considering his reputation for weaseling out of finishing commissions. And in this case, he did not even give her the opportunity to offer him money, instead sending the sketch in exchange for her hospitality. She has no she has no hold over him. Avenues open to her to procure her precious oil spill forth in her mind. If he will not enter her service, she will hound whoever becomes his patron until that person uses the power of the purse string. If he thinks he can escape her by going to Venice, he is mistaken, because she has, more than once, had the old doge eating out of her palm. But what, he do what if he does not remain in Venice and ends up in foreign service? What if he, in his profound desire to find money for his ambitious and slightly fantastic projects, goes into the service of the Sultan of the Turks? It would be just like Leonardo to sell the Sultan on his magic, and, from what Isabella has heard, just like the Sultan to buy it. What would she do then? Play the vixen to a barbarian? What hold might she, might she find over the Sultan of a foreign empire? How would she have allowed this, how could she have allowed this to happen? The magistro had slipped out of her grip like water. She is not happy. Yet she feels a slow smile creep across her face. She, Isabella d'Este, Marchesa of Mantua and daughter of the wiliest man in Italy, has been outwitted, for the moment, by a painter. Imagine. Are you guys are you guys having a problem with um am I lagging or something because I just happened to look up and saw are you guys having issues with like service reception everyone can see me and hear me okay I just want to do a, a quick check-in If you can, give me a thumbs up or something. And if, if I'm in sync with what you see and what you hear, let me know. Oh. Oh, okay. I see, I see. Okay. Epilogue. Il mondo. The world. In the year 1506, in French-occupied Milan, Isabella wishes to say so much more to her sister, who, lying in the church under cold marble, feels like a long-yearned-for confessor. Finally, here is one to whom Isabella can confide, no, one who will not take her words, spoken in confidence, and sell them to the highest bidder or the most pressing enemy. She has grown so accustomed to dissembling, especially in the last years. What relief to kneel by Beatrice's still form and pour out her thoughts— Isabella and Beatrice had wasted so many hours in inglorious competition over meaningless things. Now she wishes that Beatrice were at her side, an ally in the hundred private and public wars, both spoken and unspoken, in which she must engage to stay alive. At the rear of the church she hears the rustle of fabric. Throats begin to clear in muffled coughs. The, en the entourage grows impatient. Is it because it is late? or because they cannot wait to inform some French official that the Marchesa, despite her posture of being the, a good French loyalist, has lingered too long at the crypt of the dead Sforza Duchess. Who in her party would play the Judas, she wonders. At this moment, only the dead can be trusted. She whispers, Times are dark, my sister. Either Fortuna has ceased to smile upon us, or is demonstrating for us her great irony. The Pope's bastard and many a man's whore, Lucrezia Borgia, has married our brother, 
and Lu rules in yeah lucrezia borgia has married our brother and rules in ferrara in the stead of our pious and saintly mother her father purchased the title of duchess of ferrara with a large dowry and the threat of invasion can you imagine the grief of our dear late father who despised the spanish pope at least that corrupt creature is dead, probably from poison. Oh, no one dies any more of natural causes, but the Borgia witch has enchanted our beloved brother. I will not allow it to stand. You will not believe who else she is taking between her legs beside our brother, and it makes me too sick in the stomach to say the name. The presence of Borgia blood in the court of our parents has inspired acts of bloodshed and horror, even from members of our own family. Oh, Beatrice, regret not the sorrows you did not live to endure. And yet every morning the sun rises, bringing joys with the same randomness as it brings distress. King Louis has been thrice to visit me in my lodgings, where we discuss all manner of subjects. He is not hunched over and ugly like his predecessor, but tall and handsome, and rises gallantly as, he, as the ladies enter the room. Tonight I will dance with him in the rooms you built in the Rochetta, decorated by Bramante and the Magistro. I ironic, no? Louis has held jousting tournaments in my honor, and guess who has taken all the prizes? Our own Galeaz, who seems to thrive under every master. It is strange, my darling sister. We do not speak of you, or of Ludovico, even as memories of you haunt the very rooms where we eat, sleep, and dance, where we feel at times your spirit, wandering, watching us in our duplicity but what might be our choices death and dishonor exile demise the gonzagas might have lost mantua and our father ferrara over the mention of sforza no the whole cast of characters and assembly ca whole cast of characters assembled long ago by ludovico is still here reading their dialogue as if from an old play the words are the same but the names of the patrons have changed Oh, it is strange, Beatrice, and not a game you would have enjoyed playing. For when I speak, I hear the hollowness of my own voice mingling with the echoes of the past. Enough now. I must go, or I will never leave you. There is much to do before the ball. Did I mention the rumors of, new, of a new portrait by the Magistro? They say that a merchant approached Leonardo in Florence to do a portrait of his wife just at a time when the magistro needed to make a quick sum of money. He painted the woman and delivered the commission, but not before making a copy of it for himself. For the last three years he has carried it with him wherever he goes, changing and improving it until the sitter is no longer the merchant's wife, but some other being. Leonardo is very secretive about it all and will not reveal the identity of his model, but I have heard descriptions of the piece, which sounds as if it might have been inspired by the drawing he made of me. Is it possible, Beatrice, that after all our machinations over the magistro, that after painting all of Ludovico's lovely swans, I would emerge as his special muse? Can you, can you hear the muffled complaints and sighs of disapproval from my companions? If their mistress is found to be a traitor to the French king, they will come accompanying her to the dungeon, or wherever Louis would choose to put me. I cannot spare another minute, or I might pay for it with my kingdom. If you have any any truck with the Lord, ask him to take pity on the living, and be thankful that death has exonerated you from the evil which we must not only witness, but in which we must participate. Isabella kisses both marble cheeks of her sister's death mask, lips lingering for a moment on the cold, smooth roundness. Ludovico's face she cannot look at, for it is too lifelike. He is still with the living, though he might as well be dead. Here she is, gloating just a little over her sister's crypt, still hoping, all these years later, that she has won the final victory in their race for, pri for primacy. But that is the way with human beings. Beatrice has transcended such pettiness, she is sure, and she is at this moment forgiving Isabella's pitiful human frailty. She tries to pull away from the majestic sar sarcophagus, but it is difficult to leave, as if in parting from Beatrice, she is leaving behind some essential element of herself that is too crum too cumbersome to carry with her into the future. She would like to remain longer, but realizes that time too long spent with the dead is turning her still warm flesh cold. 
She takes her time, leaving the Santa Maria delle Grazie, allowing her entourage to fall in behind her and leading them to the prior's office, where she asks permission to enter the refectory to cast one more glance at the magistrate's portrait of our Lord and his apostles. She ignores the subtle groans and sideways glances of her attendants, who cannot wait who cannot wait to return to the castello to dress for Louise Ball. She asks them to remain in the courtyard while she alone enters the refectory. The air outside is chilly for a spring day. The sun is almost setting and the temperature is sure to drop. That will teach them. It might even rain. One cannot take in Leonardo's mural in a glance, for it is not merely a painting of an event, but a fully animated production. Yet it is the resignation of the face of Jesus that captures Isabella's attention in this, her second viewing. She is struck by Jesus' quiet acquiescence to his fate, in contrast with the entourage, with the outrage, shock, and denial registered on the faces of the apostles. It is as if he is saying, regretfully but with complete acceptance, that this is the very nature of man, to betray. And is it not? One thousand five hundred years after God sent his Son to earth to demonstrate the godliness of all, we are still the same, betrayers, rejecting the hand that would reach for us from above and pull us up into grace, into glory, into heaven. The betrayal of Judas began on a Wednesday. That is what they said in Milan when all faces turned away from Ludovico and toward the French king. Isabella thinks that she has seen that expression of res resignation on Leonardo's face. The magistro painted the face of Jesus, nonchalant, and at the moment in which he reveals his awareness that he will be betrayed by one whom he has loved. The same artist, that same artist quickly forgot the favors enjoyed under Ludovico and now serves the king of France. Who can blame him? He too was betrayed when Ludovico foiled each of Leonardo's ambitious plans by keeping him busy with ephemera, ephemera by withholding his pay, by sending the coveted bronze for the horse for cannon fodder. The horse now sits in ruins in the grand piazza at the entrance of the castello, shot to pieces by zealous French archers out to have some fun. Why is it that not, why has it not yet been removed is a puzzle to Isabella. It lies in bits and pieces in its noble body parts so lovingly studied by the magistro fall into the ground. The head, legs, and torso lie in inert, in, in inert shambles dissected just the way it was that Leonardo had put up, cut up human bodies so as to see what was inside. Mm, man. What must he think when he sees his masterpiece destroyed, crumbling to greater decay with every rain? In years to come, who... In the years to come, who will care that the French occupied Italy for a brief period of time? For Isabella is certain it will be brief, considering the scope of her country's history. She is not even bothering to learn good French. But Leonardo's beautiful horse, which might have lasted as long as the statues of the ancient masters, will be dust, just like those who brought about his demise. She is weary of these thoughts, these problems of loyalty and morality. She turns away from the face of Jesus only to confront the image of her sister on the wall opposite, painting into Montoforano's mural. Beatrice is in prayer, hands folded over delicately, face luminous and, and composed as she looks upon our Lord's suffering. The magistro captured a sadness in Beatrice that Isabella had not observed while her sister was alive. Perhaps it settled upon her at the end, along with her troubles. Jesus might be gazing upon her for all eternity. Two martyrs, her sister and the Christ. Two innocents, betrayed. Mm. Man, I'm sorry guys, my eyes are getting really tired. We have just a few pages left. I can do it. <laughs> I can do it. Enough of the dead. Isabella walks out of the room, leaving the refectory, the church, and the corpse of Beatrice behind, and re-entering the world of the living, where the setting sun has turned the white blossoms of the trees in the courtyard to a deep violet. Take us to the Corte Vecchia, she commands the driver of her carriage.
The attendants try once more to stifle their dismay. They did not know that the Marchesa was going to take them on an entire tour of the city of Milan, wearing them out and denying them the hours they require to assemble their costumes and toilette for the evening's festivities. All the better, she thinks. The gaggle of beautiful ladies who accompany her everywhere and for which she has known sometimes and for which she is known for sometimes arrive a bit overdressed. The less time they have to apply rouge to their cheeks and jewels to their hair, the better. For they know that it is their job to support the beauty and appearance of Isabella without exceeding it. Women being what they are, however, a few always try to get away without shining their mistress. Come, ladies, quit your groaning, she sighs. One must be flexible if one does not want to end one's life upon a cross or another. Man. I thought I could finish it. My I, I keep going cross-eyed. Oh my gosh. Okay. It's ridiculous, but I've got two, like, three pages left, but I can't. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I, um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to reread this on Friday. I know it's, it's literally going to be the shortest, like, read ever, but, um, yeah, I gotta, I gotta stop. Like, my eyes are getting cross-eyed. Woof. Um, so, okay. I'm gonna finish this up. I'm gonna finish this up on Friday. Same time, 8 o'clock. It's literally, <laughs> it's literally gonna take, like, maybe 10 minutes. So, you know, um, stick around for, stick around for that if you want. Um, but I have, I gotta call it quits. My eyeballs are getting fuzzy and sticky and cross-eyed. So, um, like my announcement from earlier, I'll remake it today, or remake it right now. After this book is done, after we're finished on Friday with this, I am going to take a break, uh, with my reading for July. Because the summer's just busy, and I got some other stuff I need to get done, and the, the reading schedule was a little ambitious, I will admit. So... Um, once we get closer toward the fall, I will pick back up, um, but before that, I will, probably the last weekend in July, I will be sure to make a video, um, choosing three more books, so you guys can choose which ones we read, first, second, third. Um, but until Friday, thank you for joining me, um, again, I'm sorry I couldn't muscle through the last few bits of the reading, but I was losing my space on pages, and I was spacing out i know so you guys have a fantastic night stay hydrated and stay safe and i will see you friday at eight o'clock have a good night Mwah.